Yep, you don't need to come up here. Hey, Princess, your shirt matches your mommy and your dad's name. I gotta get down and eat. Why were you in monopoly? For practice, Papa was sitting.
stand with me and take your hymnals and turn to hymn 356. We'll sing all three verses of Only a Sinner, hymn 356. Thank you. You can go ahead and be seated. I'm going to do the announcements now early and uh, throw off the order completely. So I apologize for that. Um, and then at the, after the interlude, the musical interlude this evening, uh, Brother Paul Sealing is going to come with the evening message and we'll close this out. And then uh, we'll have the final song. So we'll do the announcements now this morning or this afternoon or whatever time it is. So first announcement, uh, congratulations to Omar and Tracy. If you had not heard Omar and Tracy Schrock, um, Katie, I'm sorry, not Katie, Sadie K. Schrock was born yesterday, so we welcome the newest member of our congregation, so congrats to them. Um, secondly, we are looking for feedback um, on the projector, the words on the screen, that kind of thing, uh, addition, change to our services. So if you have any input on that, Brian Jay would be very eager to hear what you have to say about that. And then these upcoming events, keep in mind, please, um, this Tuesday will be the next men's Bible study here at the church, 6.30 p.m. That usually goes till 7.30 or 8. Um, so, gentlemen, every other Tuesday on that. Then um, most of these are in your bulletin from Wednesday, if you still have it. November the 5th, which is a Friday, is our next teen activity, 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Then November the 6th is the next men's prayer meeting at 7.30 a.m. And then uh, two weeks from today will be November 7th. That will be the um, daylight savings time end so keep that in mind if that's not already on your calendar and that will be our monthly potluck fellowship for the month of October then also coming up in November um, later we do have an, a youth activity on the 19th we're doing a progressive dinner with the teens so we are looking for some families to help us host the progressive dinner so if you'd be interested in participating with that please talk to Rhonda and uh, she can give you the details on that and then also keep in mind, um, please have your donations in for the Adopt-A-Family activity that's going on um, before November the 14th, if you would, please. And I think that's everything to announce. So let's uh, open now with a word of prayer and ask the Lord's blessing upon the remainder of our service. Unto thee, O God, do we give thanks. Unto thee do we give thanks. For thy name is near, thy wondrous works declare. And Father, tonight our prayer is that you would meet with us in such a way that we would remember that we have met here for your purpose, for your glory, to sing your praises, 
And Father, this is about you. And help us as we take time here tonight to gather as a church and as a congregation to uplift your name, to sing praises to you, to honor your son in the way we live, and to use your spirit to execute the commands you have given to us in your word. May we honor Jesus Christ in all that we do. May we love the brethren. May we uh, be a people who love Jesus Christ and who exercise that on a day daily basis. Ask your blessing, please, upon the many who could not be here tonight. Uh, Father, keep them safe, please, and bring us back again. Thank you for the good report of the Schrock baby and everyone's healthy, and we are so thankful for that. And Father, for you, for your presence, for your love, and for the grace that you have bestowed upon us. We ask your blessing now upon this service. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. We you take your hymnals again and turn to hymn 340? We'll sing the first, second, and last verses of Christ Receiveth Sinful Men, hymn 340. <laughs> Turn back a few pages to hymn 124. We'll sing all five verses of Fountain of Grace, hymn 124.
you'll stand with me again and take your hymnals and turn to hymn 491. We'll sing as all four verses of Is Your All on the Altar, hymn 491.
Well, good evening. It's good to see all of you here tonight. My uh, big thank you to uh, all the people that participate in the music ministry. It is just wonderful. Just wonderful. Um, those of you that have grown up in this church uh, and have never been to another church, you don't know what you have here. Okay? Uh, I can honestly say that. I mentioned that to Brad Rice many years ago when he was preparing to leave. Um, this was the church that he knew. And I said, Brad, you don't know what you have here. He came back several months later and said, now I know what you're saying. And, uh, and so I say the same thing about the music. Thank you for all the instrumentalists. Uh, thank you for parents that are spending the money and the time to get children to practice. That's not an easy task. Okay. Uh, thank you as well for those that have gone through that process and as adults have maintained that despite your busy schedules, working and whatnot, practicing and preparing to bless us with music and prepare our hearts for the worship service. It is a part of worship, and I think the Lord is very pleased with that. And so I thank you all for that very much. Uh, okay, tonight I am going to address a subject that we don't hear much about. It's very common. Uh, nothing will be new uh, when we look at this uh, tonight. But it's not something that we tend to talk about that much. Uh, if you look on the internet and you look up this word, you're not going to find anything from an evangelical perspective. And the word is confession. If you look that up in the internet, what you're going to see, all of the sites are Roman Catholic or some Eastern Orthodox. And there is much on the internet about that. But what about just very simple biblical confession? We don't have that much on the internet about that. Now, there are nuances of it. If you change the word and you go in to look at a part of it, like if you go to repentance, you'll see a lot when it comes to evangelical, fundamental, you know, Christians that believe the way we would. You'll see a lot there. But confession is different than repentance. Repentance is part of it. But confession is not repentance, okay? It's something very close, but it has its own meaning, and I think we want to address that tonight, okay? Now, when we word that, uh, hear that word confession, and we think through the Rolodex in our mind of the verses that we've memorized, one of them is going to come right to the top. I think most of us, if not all of us, have memorized it. Uh, and those that haven't, I'm sure if they stay in this church, will memorize it very quickly. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that is absolutely, 100% true. But I wonder, is if we are, as we are looking at that, are there, is it too easy to pass over that? Is it too easy to cite that, to practice that in our life, and go on about our business? What does confession really mean? Okay, I've been reading a book recently, a book by Andrew Murray uh, on confession, The Road to Forgiveness. It is a devotional commentary, very short chapters and whatnot, 120 pages, I think, is really all it is. Uh, he uh, lived in the mostly in the... 19th century, I think he died about 100 years ago, uh, an English pastor, uh, but just a wealth of really dwelling on this aspect, a commentary on Psalm 51, which is what we're going to look at tonight, okay? Uh, <clears throat> the reason why I, I mention this is I had an experience uh, many, many years ago when I was a brand new Christian, probably 40 years ago, if, no, it's probably 50 years ago now, maybe, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I was in a service, and the man was preaching. I think he was a visiting pastor. And he was telling the story of a church that he had visited. I believe, if I'm right, an evangelist. He was preaching in this church. And the church had a huge problem uh, that eventually the entire church found out about. 
and it, what it was was a man in the church, I don't know if he was a prominent man, if he was a deacon or this, that, or another, uh, had committed adultery with another man's wife in the church. And it so happened, if I remember the story correctly, again, my memory is, is starting to go, I, I, I remember the punchline very much, the details may be uh, a little bit off, but uh, he was there, I think, when they brought it before the church. And so it was part of the service or something to that effect. And uh, the woman uh, got up and co confessed her sin, and uh, the man did as well, and they apparently were, were able to resolve this in the church, and the church got kind of stabilized out again. But the thing that I remember was what he said after the service. The man that had committed adultery with the other man's wife went up to her husband, stuck out his hand, and said, no hard feelings. That has stayed with me my entire life. Was that confession? Uh, it could be if it was sincerely meant, but it certainly was not the right thing to say. And what I want to take us to tonight is when we go before the Lord and we have sinned against him, do we sometimes have that attitude? We're faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and we go on about our prayer without seriously thinking about what we have done to the Lord and what our sin really is. So I want to explore that tonight from David's perspective in his great psalm. We're all familiar with it. Again, you'll not hear anything new tonight. Uh, we're going to try to tie the setting together, that type of thing. But uh, <clears throat> let's turn in our Bibles first to the setting. We need to get there first, okay? Uh, let's turn to 2 Samuel, and we see what is the situation here. This is the setting, the backdrop for this prayer of David in Psalm 51. Well, we all know uh, what transpired here. Uh, David, uh, when he should have been going out to battle, uh, was basically staying at home. And his mind began to wander. He saw Bathsheba. She was probably not in the place that she should have been. Uh, the, they wound up getting together, in them committing adultery, and she went back home. She found out, obviously, some weeks later that she was expecting a child. Uh-oh, David had to go and cover this up. And so we know the whole story about him trying to get Uriah to come home, to spend time with his wife, and therefore the child would be his, and nobody would be any worse for the wear. But Uriah was a godly man. Uh, remember, he was a Hittite. Okay? Here is a godly man that was not an Israelite by birth. Okay? Uh, that makes the, the contrast between a godly man and an ungodly man one was godly and not from a godly people. One was from a godly people and not an ungodly man in this situation. David, a man after God's own heart. It really illustrates how bad David's sin was here. He has a man that is from a despised people that is so faithful to him that he can't get him to cover up this sin no matter what he tries. And so the solution is, well, we'll just have to kill Uriah. He sends a note off to Joab. Joab's an interesting fellow. Very, very faithful and loyal to David. At the same time, at, at times he had very perceptive observations that were even better than David's in the numbering of the people of Israel. But at the same time, he was a self-server, uh, and he will do anything to climb the ladder, so to speak. Um, he was at the top of the ladder, so why he thought he had to do that, I don't know. But bottom line was, Joab did David's bidding. He put Uriah in the hottest place of the battle, and as a result, Uriah is killed. Problem solved. 
David marries Bathsheba, and everything is going to be fine. The child is born. So this is sometime later. And all commentators basically say that this is up to a year later after this horrendous act on David's part is when Nathan finally comes to him, and we have the story here. Let's look at the first 14 verses of chapter 12. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb which he had brought and nourished up, and he grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay on his bosom and was like unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And, sa and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Notice those words. Because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Okay? And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I moreover would have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me and thou hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thy eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto the Lord, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. How be it, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to of the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Note a couple things here in this last couple of verses. Okay? First off, David immediately recognizes that he is the man. He's, said, he's told that he is the man, and he immediately owns up to it. That is what the basis of Psalm 51 is. But notice as well, as soon as he admits to that, that is not the end. Rem notice here that Nathan did not say before David said, I have sinned. Nathan did not say the child will die. It was after David said, I have sinned. He confessed his sin and the Lord said, I'm not through yet. This is serious business. Very, very serious business. And we will see that David understood it as serious business. So I go back to our comparison, a beautiful verse that we need to cling to, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But this is serious business, folks. So let's turn to Psalm 51 and see how David addresses this. And do a little self-critiquing of your own life to see where do I stand, how do I stand with David as far as the quality of my confession. Now, we're not here trying to go and look at merchandise in a store saying this one's of higher quality or not. This is... Self-introspection, how do I measure up? Do I really seriously take my sin before the Lord? 
or am I quick to faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness? Okay, let's look at this. All right, notice what the sequence is. Okay, the first few verses from verses one to seven, we will see that David is asking for the Lord to cleanse him. Okay, this is an important concept that we don't dwell on nearly as much in the New Testament, but it was the center of everything in, in Jewish, Israelite worship. It was this matter of cleansing. Was somebody clean or were they unclean? We had clean animals that you could keep, but unclean animals you could not eat. There were all kinds of services and special rituals that you had to go to to get clean, okay? And it happened regularly. Not only regularly, but it happened to large numbers of people because of the society in which they live. For example, today we don't have a problem nearly, nothing in the Western world, on leprosy. It was a huge problem in the Middle East. And there was a whole series, and we're going to look at some of the ways that they had to be cleansed and the process that it went through. Folks, it was very elaborate. And it was time consuming. But this is the picture that David is saying. He recognizes that his sin has made him unclean and it is going to take time and effort on his part as he's using these pictures to get clean before the Lord. Does that mean that we have to as the Roman Catholics would say, we have to go to a confession and we have to see the priest and this, that, and the other thing. No, that's not the case at all. Do I need to give penance and say so many Hail Marys and so many rosaries and all of this, that, and the other thing? Absolutely not. But by throwing those out and rightly throwing those out, we have thrown out something that they emphasized and that was, how about proving that you really are repenting of your sin. This matter of confession is serious business. And, you know, the proverbial throwing out the baby with the bathwater type of thing, we've lost a little bit. I do not want to go back to Roman Catholicism. I would not advocate you looking at any of their uh, processes and, and their rituals or anything like that. Would not advocate that at all. But let's look at God's word. They are taking little bits and pieces from scripture that are God-inspired and distorting them to the point that we have tended to throw them away. Okay, And this matter of time and cleansing and the process is something that, remember, Old Testament is written, the former things were written, that we may know and understand and apply the New Testament. Christ has done this all for us. Okay? We don't have to worry about all of these sacrifices and whatnot. But there is some lessons that we can learn in this idea of treating it seriously. Oh, there's some time involved here, okay? Or are we going to be like the guy, no hard feelings, okay? I, that's what I, I think we want to look at today, okay? So notice in these first seven verses. Notice verse 1, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Uh, this is his first opening salvo in his, salvo's the wrong word, uh, pleading to the Lord that he would have mercy upon him. What is mercy? How does it differ from grace? Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. Grace is him giving us what we don't deserve. He's going to worry about the grace later. But Lord, I deserve to be punished by death. He said his own sentence, the man shall surely die. And the Lord's going to have to jump in very quickly and say, you're not going to die. Okay? And this is interesting because he was pardoned directly by God because there was no earthly power that could go and hold David accountable. He was the law, but he, he recognized that he was under subject of God, and God said, I am going to be merciful to you. Okay, we'll talk about that later when we see a verse that said, uh, uh, <clears throat> deliver me from blood, blood guiltiness. Okay, we'll see that in just a minute. Okay? 
But notice he says, don't give me what I deserve. That is what mercy is. Okay. Notice verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Okay? This idea of washing and cleansing. Again, this is a difficult thing. A picture in Old Testament, washing and the cleaning of clothes was probably one of the most difficult tasks that women had to do in Old Testament era. We've got beautiful washing machines. Folks, I, I love them. You know, you just throw the clothes in, you throw some so soap, poop, you know, and it buzzes at the end, and we even get irritated with the buzzer. You know, it's like, I know. You know, it buzzes three times or four times, you know, and it's like, hey, but it's easy for us to clean clothes. And yet at the same time, I ask you ladies with young children, is this not a tedious task? It just never seems to end, Okay. That's what the Lord, uh, that's what David is asking of the Lord. Wash me. He understands from his society how difficult that task is. Okay? Notice verse 3. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. This is really important, folks. How often do we ask for forgiveness and we never think about it again? It's flippant the way we approach the Lord sometimes. Oh, Lord, sorry, forgive me. And then we go on about our business. David said this is the right attitude. Now, we have to be careful. Let's, don't, don't turn me off when I say something here because we're going to have a look at a couple more verses, okay? But David said my sin is ever before me. I recognize what I have done, and it is serious, serious business, okay? Now, is that changed in the New Testament? Let's take a look at a couple verses. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13. Philippians 3, 13. <clears throat> I always look at 2. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Paul speaking, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So, application, shouldn't we in the New Testament just forget all this stuff? The Lord has separated our sin as far as the east is from the west, and we all know what that means. You can hop in an airplane and you can start flying east and keep going. When you, when you get to the end of east, then land. You'll never land. Well, let's turn around and go west, okay? You'll keep flying until you run out of heartbeats, okay? Because as far as the east is from the west. Not so with north and south. You can go all the way to the north till you can't go north anymore. He said that's the, there's two places on the face of the earth that you can never be lost, the north pole and the south pole, because there's only one way to go, either north or south. That's kind of a joke and such. So. <clears throat> but is that what Paul is saying here? Just forget everything that you've done. Well, let's look at another thing. First, uh, another verse. First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13. Notice what he is saying. I thank Christ, this is verse 12, I thank, uh, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Paul was persecuting the church, yes. He killed Christians, yes. He did that believing that he was doing the right thing and serving God. There is a world of difference between that and what David did. And there's a world of difference between that and what I do when I deliberately sin against the Lord. Because I know better. Okay, Paul did not know better. He had to go and put those, I killed all of those Christians, behind him. He did not realize that he was doing evil. But is that apply to most of our sins, folks? Don't we do most of our sins when we know that we should not do them? We fall into the category with David, okay? 
So I think this applies that if we are serious about our sin, it should be something that is on our mind. It is not something that we easily forget. Now, we have to be careful, folks. Because we got to read the whole psalm because David is going to pray for restoration. He is going to pray for a renewed spirit in him. And the Holy Spirit can go and take and work in a... But this flippancy that we see so much of today that, okay, we can just go and, well, I, I tried my hardest, you know. Uh, I hope I can forgive myself, you know. And all of these ideas that are very prevalent in our society and I think have crept into the church, we have to be very careful of. This is serious business, okay? Look at verse 4. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in my, thy sight. There's a lot of argument by commentators that said, hey, this can't be the title of this, a Psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone to Bathsheba, gone in to Bathsheba. This can't be accurate because he had sinned against Uriah and he had sinned against Bathsheba. When in reality, I would say, Uriah was dead, okay? And Bathsheba was a participant in the sin. And so he said, I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. But Lord, against thee and thee only have I sinned. We need to get to that place that no matter how badly we have maybe hurt other people, it's hurt the Lord a lot more. And that in comparison, the only person that we have really sinned against is our Heavenly Father. That is not to say that we aren't to keep our accounts short, and if we do wrong somebody else, we go very quickly to them. But in comparison as to who's suffered here, the Lord Jesus Christ has suffered infinitely more for our sin than anybody that we have sinned against. Okay, Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when you when you judge. Notice in verse 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Here's another uh, opportunity for people that don't like uh, to take the Bible directly in context, say, ah, see, here he's claiming that his mother just uh, being born was a sinful act. No, what he's really saying here is that David is admitting this isn't just a single act. Lord, I am standing before you as sinner. From the time I was conceived and born, my heart has wavered and gone away. It's a really, it's a stab at the folks that say we don't have original sin. Okay? And that's what David's admitting here. Lord, I'm coming to you with this horrendous sin, but it's not like this is the first time I'm, I need to be forgiven. I am shapen in iniquity from the time I was born. I have a sinful nature. It is corrupt through and through. I need your grace. I need your washing and your cleansing from every aspect of it. That's what he's saying here. Okay? Notice verse 6. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. You know what he's saying here? He's saying here that his thoughts are corrupt. He's basically saying what the Lord said in Matthew 5, 28. If a man looks on a woman to lust after, he's already committed adultery in his heart. And David's saying, that's me. Before Bathsheba was called and came to his palace, he had sinned. That is ser taking your sin seriously. And David is doing that. Okay. And now let's take a look at this idea of verse 7, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. What is this hyssop? Well, a hyssop is almost, uh, it's a plant that grows over in the Middle East and it's got a very uh, furry stem. We'd almost look at it like a pipe cleaner, okay? Something like maybe pipe cleaners aren't a good term that young people would know what a pipe cleaner is. I grew up with a my dad smoked a pipe, so I know what pipe cleaners were. But yeah, maybe you'll see them in art class where it's basically a stem with it's very fuzzy on the outside. And really what's, what it's designed to do, there's no real significance in it other than you can dip it in, in a liquid and it will hold the liquid. 
and in the Old Testament, what they used this in the offerings, the priest would go and use hyssop, and he'd dip it in the blood, and then he would sprinkle it. I mean, it holds a lot of blood. It's kind of like a paintbrush, okay? And you can go and shake it on things. And that's exactly what David is referring to here. So if we go back to two stories, I'm not going to read them, but let's go uh, to Leviticus chapter 14. And the first 20 verses, we're not going to read the entire chapter. If anybody just takes a look at how long chapter 14 is, it happens to be the 10th longest chapter in the Bible. So it's, uh, it's pretty long, okay? But just look through this here as I kind of talk through it here, okay? Let's look down. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, let's just read the first couple verses to get the context. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. Remember what David had asked for. Wash me. Clean me. Use hyssop on me. Okay, what's this hyssop? Okay. Uh, the priest shall go forth out of the camp. The priest shall look, and behold, if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper. This is the story about the leprosy. And then notice uh, what he's going to take here. Then shall the priest command to take for him that is to be cleansed two birds alive with clean and clean and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop. There's the hyssop, okay? And then it, there's going to be a bunch of other things that he's going to take, animals. They're going to go and sacrifice those, and he's going to dip the hyssop in the blood and, uh, and sprinkle it on the person that has the leprosy. And then notice in verse 8, and he shall tarry abroad out of his tent for seven days. Okay? And he's going to shave all the hair off of his body, eyebrows and eyelashes, and he shall be clean. On the eighth day he shall take two he lambs and make another offering. Okay, And the, Lord, and the priest is going to take, if you continue on down, uh, verse 14, he's going to take some of the blood and he's going to put it on the right ear of the person that had leprosy on his right thumb, and on his right toe. You say, wow, this is a pretty elaborate procedure. What can we learn out of this? Well, I think we can apply the fact that the Lord needs to, and the Lord applies healing to what we hear. And do we not think that there are a bunch of people in our country that need to have their ears opened? Okay? They are not anointed by the Lord. Okay? What I do, my hands is what I do things with, and my toes are what I use to go places, that the Lord is going to go and cleanse this man, what he hears, what he does, and where he goes. Okay? <clears throat> but this is a process that's taking time, folks. Okay? Notice he had to spend seven days. He's going to have to cut off all of his hair. This is a pretty elaborate process. Okay? That's all I want to say here. We don't a lack of time here. Let's go to Numbers chapter 19. This is a little bit different, but things should stick out to you here. The first 13 verses here. And notice in verse 2, this is the ordinance of the law which the Lord hath commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring thee a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came yoke. Some of you may be interested in following the red heifer. Incredibly interesting to the Orthodox people over in, in Israel. They are looking for the red heifer. Okay, uh, one that does not have a white hair. They thought they had one in Texas about, oh, must be five or seven years ago. And it, 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 it was national news. It was world news. Okay, maybe they found a red heifer. And, uh, but lo and behold, apparently she grew a white hair and uh, false alarm. Okay, so bottom line is uh, this red heifer, this process, the heifer is going to be offered, okay, and they're going to collect all of the ashes and they're going to mix that with water. And when somebody touches somebody that is dead, they are immediately unclean. Remember what David's asking for, for cleansing here, okay? And they have to be anointed with some of this water. Now, there was a large quantity of it. They put the ashes in this, and they saved it up and saved it up and saved it up. There are some sources that say that there were only eight red heifers in the entire history of Israel's time. But in order to be able to cleanse the temple and to have the restart of sacrifices, they need some of these. So they're looking for this red heifer. Okay, That's the backdrop of, of what the red heifer is. 
But notice when it comes to anointing somebody that has touched somebody that has died and they are unclean, notice what's required. It's exactly the same thing that, that, the, that with the hyssop that the, the leper had. Okay, And notice what uh, he says in verse 11. He that toucheth the dead body of any man shall be unclean seven days. He shall purify himself with it, that's that water, on the third day. And on the seventh day he shall be clean. But if he purify not himself the third day, then the seventh day he shall not be clean. Whosoever toucheth the dead body of any man that is dead and purifieth not himself, defileth the tabernacle of the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from Israel because the water of separation was not sprinkled upon him. He shall be unclean. His uncleanness is yet upon him. If he was in America, we would say, throw that guy out of the country and never let him come back. If he didn't anoint himself with water on the third day after he touched the dead body and then the seventh. I am so glad that the Lord has removed this law from us. Okay, But can we learn anything from this? That this idea of becoming clean is a process. And David is acknowledging that in Psalm 51. This is what he's thinking about, folks. That it's, it's a process of getting clean. Now, is this David doing the work? No, it's the Lord doing the work. But again, I go back to our, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Good. Uh, what are we having for supper? Okay? That's the mindset that we've got to get out of, that this confession is incredibly important. Okay, that's, uh, let's go on to verse 8. I'm just going to go very quickly now because we have to close. But this second section is he's not just praying for cleansing. He is praying for restoration. Okay? Notice in verse 8, he prays for joyfulness. Folks, if you have joy, that is the only assurance of your salvation. When you sin and you separate yourself from the Lord, you know the joy is gone. And I know personally for me, it's like, hey, maybe I didn't deceive myself. I'm not a Christian. And there's no assurance there until you get right with the Lord. And you get right with the Lord, and it's like, oh, yes, I'm a Christian. Give me that joy. That's what David wants. He'd been a year without it, folks. Okay, It's possible for us to stay away for a long time. Look at verse 9. Uh, he said, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Okay, The Christian is different from the unsaved when he can't stand having those impurities on him. There's a difference between pigs and sheep. You can throw them both in the mud. The difference is pigs say, whoopee. The sheep says, get me out of here. If you get a sheep and it gets covered with mud, it is not a happy creature. It just You, you can see it in their face. It's like, I hate this, I hate this, I hate this. Get me out of here. That is what David, he's, he's praying for purity here. Okay? <clears throat> Uh, notice, uh, <clears throat> well, let's see. Let's, let, let's skip down. I'm going to have to skip a few places there. Uh, he's, he's praying for closeness, internal and external. Give me thy spirit, Lord. Restore unto me the spirit. Take not thy spirit from me. And external, that I may show the joy that I have to other people. Okay? Uh, he prays for privilege, for re uh, relationship and strength, that he would have that restored to him. He is asking the Lord to renew all of those things that were cut off when this horrible sin had taken place. And then lastly, in the verses 13 to uh, 15, he says, uh, use me uh, uh, as the fruit of forgiveness. Let me be an effective teacher. Look at verse 13. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways? Uh, Paul was concerned that he would be a castaway. Lest I have preached to others, I would be a castaway. That's David's thought right here. Okay, And then notice in verse 14, uh, my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. He wants to sing aloud of what the Lord has done. Folks, when we're doing that, the Lord is using that in other people's lives. And so he is praying for that as well. 
And then notice in verse 15, open my lips and my mouth shall shew forth thy praise. He is testifying in his praise to the Lord. Lord, use me like I haven't been used in a year. Okay? And then notice he is asking for the ability to be used to influence others. Notice in verse 15 and 16, uh, excuse me, 16 and 17, thou desirest not sacrifice a broken and a contrite heart. Verse 17, O God, thou wilt not despise. He's, ex he's, a pr he's praying for influence inwardly, but also externally. Look at in verses 18 and 19. Do good to thy pleasant uh, do good in thy good uh, pleasure unto Zion, build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness. It says up here, oh, this, this is a contradiction, verse 17, the Lord desires not burnt offerings. No, he wants our hearts. But then, when there is outward sacrifices, okay, I'm pleased with that. You can't have one without the other, okay? Both internal and external uh, sacrifices. So here is David giving us a model prayer. I think we can look at this as we confess our sins before the Lord. We ought to do it regularly, and we need to be serious about it and take time to make sure that we are not being flippant about the way we approach our Lord. Okay, let's close in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you express the great, great joy that we can have by being thy children. And Lord, we thank you for your very infinite graciousness, your infinite mercy. But Lord, you do expect us to be serious. And we pray, Lord, that we would indeed take our sins seriously, that we would keep our accounts short with thee, and that we would come before thee, and that, Lord, you would uh, have a wide path for thy Holy Spirit to influence our lives and therefore to influence other lives. We ask this for your sake. Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. And we'll sing the first verse of hymn 497, Search Me, O God, hymn 497.